Scott, as I guess you all know, is the brilliant and visionary author of two books, The Ascent of Humanity and Sacred Economics, as well as many, many particles, in which he's helping us to imagine and to create a new world. And his memorable phrase, the more beautiful world that our hearts tell us is possible. Last night I was at an event at which Charles was in conversation with um, Nima Namudamu, who's an amazing woman activist and leader from the Congo. And part of the premise for that conversation was that if we can change things around in the Congo, then we can change things around anywhere. I think we face exactly the same situation here with Los Alamos National Laboratory. That was the birthplace of all the nuclear weapons on our planet. It's the birthplace of all nuclear power stations on our planet. And so the horrors and the injustices of Hiroshima, of Nagasaki, of the nuclear weapons testing that happened in this country, of the nuclear weapons testing that happened in the South Pacific and the Marshall Islands, of the accidents at Chernobyl and at Fukushima, and all the many hundreds and thousands of smaller but no less significant accidents, contaminations, deaths, all of those stem from Lamel. And Lamel is now just one part of a multi billion dollar a year nuclear weapons industry in this country, one eighth of the NNSA in this country a very entrenched part of the military-industrial complex in which we all live. So, if we can transform Lanel, we can transform anything. And frankly, we have to transform Lanel. Living as we do, just a few miles from the lab, with just the Rio Grande Valley in between us and the mesas on which it sits, and all the volcanic geology underneath it, it's pretty much always amazing to me that there aren't thousands upon thousands of us out in the streets trying to change what's happening there. That events like this aren't absolutely swamped with thousands and thousands of people. I believe that part of the explanation for the relatively small numbers that get involved in this issue is because the issue is so huge and so horrifying that we can't bring ourselves to it. We can't comprehend how change and transformation is possible. And so what we need is not just the data and the information about how bad things are, and they are pretty bad, but also visions and inspirations for what's possible, for what the transformation could be like, visions that can uplift us and can empower us as a community so that together we do take action. And that for me is where Charles comes in, the visionary piece. So, before I invite Charles up and before we, we hear what he has to say, I just want to say a little bit about how this is going to go. Charles is going to speak for 20, 25 minutes or so um, about what he sees as possible, about what he sees the transformation could be. But part of what we've learned over the months of, of working in this, um, of Nuke Free Now, having conversations and getting together, is that we really have need to have community conversations about this. The people, all of us here probably tonight, have a lot that we feel and that we think about this issue and that we want to say and to share with our community, whether that's ideas and visions for what's possible, whether it's the sadness and the grief about what's happened, about what is happening. So, after Charles has spoken, we're going to open it up and you can bring your questions to Charles, bring your questions to each other, bring your visions, bring your ideas, bring your sadness and your grief, if, if that's what you want to bring in this community tonight. And we'll just have a, a chance to begin what I hope will become the first of many community conversations around this topic. So, Charles, if you'd like to come and come.
Hello, everybody. Hello. You know, I, I look around the world and, and see all that's happening, um, alternating between hope and despair, and, uh, you know, the, the deserts that are spreading and the oceans that all the fish are dying and, and climate uh, heating up and uh, the prison industrial complex, you know, and something like a third of all children in America were abused, and not to mention what's happening in Congo to the rainforests and, and all the potential uh, solutions out there too. And, and, and then, you know, I think of like, what does is, what is Earth really need right now? Maybe it's some more bombs. <laughs> it just seems so absurd. Like it doesn't even like you know when I when I look at it from that perspective, I don't even understand why there has to even be a conversation or a debate about about you know is really come on is that really what the Earth needs right now is some more bombs? Like let alone the consequences of building those bombs. Uh, it, it's it's self-evidently insane, and people, at least some people, always saw it as insane. Uh, even back in the fifties, there were people who were talking about nuclear madness, uh, but they were uh, a small minority uh, because in the fifties and the sixties during the Cold War, there was still a story or even you could call it a mythology, from which one could reasonably maintain that nuclear weapons were necessary. Right? There was a story about the communists, you know, and Russia, and freedom and democracy, and the American way, and we're the good guys, and, and it's, you know, deterrence, and, and all that kind of stuff, right? And without doing, without too enormous an effort at self-deception, you could still kind of, you could buy into that story. You know, most people did, with the exception of some, some radicals and leftists and people like that. Uh, you could still affirm that and uh, believe that nuclear weapons were not insane. Um, but that's really not possible anymore. The, the, the psychic burden of of believing that we still need, or that there's any justification for building nuclear weapons, that that psychic burden of self-deception is getting stronger and stronger. Uh, and I think that we're, one way to look at what's going on now is that the nuclear weapons industry is itself in a crisis, looking for a reason to exist. So you can say that we're nearing the end of an era. Um, and this end of an era, really the nuclear age is itself the end of a much longer era. There's something special about nuclear weapons. They mark a change in human consciousness. Because for the first time in history, we have weapons that are too terrible to use. We used them once or twice. Uh, and in the 70 years since, have never used them again for, for purposes of war. The hydrogen bomb has never been used for purposes of war. Which is actually quite remarkable. So I'm thinking about what, what's really coming to an end here with the nuclear age. I think it's something much deeper than uh, the story of us versus them, uh, America versus Russia. Um, much deeper than, than the story of the brilliant scientists in their white coats who uh, are super competent and know better than we do what's safe and what isn't, and we can believe them, and we can trust the government, and we can trust the experts, and trust the authorities, and trust science and technology 
to uh, lead us into a perfect world, uh, a world of, of uh, leisure and security, and, and like that's kind of coming to an end too. But there's something even more that's coming to an end, and this other thing that's coming to an end has powerful consequences, not only for, for technology and war and peace, but also for our own activism, how we uh, approach this problem, how we uh, ap approach nuclear healing. What's really coming to an end? Well, one way to put it is that what's coming to an end is conquering evil. What's coming to an end is the separation between self and other. Because the whole idea of a weapon, it's something that you use against somebody who's not yourself. And it hurts that person, but it doesn't hurt you. That's why you have the weapon. And everybody who uses a weapon has some kind of justification, some kind of, uh, of story in which you're, you're the good guy and that's the bad guy. And so your use of force is, is, is justified. It's okay to do this. Nuclear weapons made that kind of impossible to uphold. Uh, we didn't quite get it maybe in the 1940s when we bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki that this is going to harm ourselves as well. We didn't get that then, but it's becoming, everybody knows it now, like you can't use a nuclear weapon because of the fallout. I mean, the word fallout has become, it, this concept is so well known that fallout is uh, a metaphor, like the fallout of an act, an act, right? We take this metaphor from, from nuclear, uh, bombs and, and accidents. Uh, and so we understand now that we're not, we're not separate from the rest of the planet. So nuclear weapons have actually um, kind of uh, catalyzed this understanding that what we do to the world and what we do to anybody else we're doing to ourselves as well. And this um, connection between ourselves and the rest of the world comes out in so many ways. Uh, we're not, you know, wanting to use the bombs on ourselves, yet the mirror image of this violence, the shadow of this violence, is afflicting all of us today. It's, uh, at the very least, it's this, this cloud that hangs over our heads, you know, that, that catastrophe is just this close. I'd like to uh, think about, well, okay. The end of a, of a, a story, the end of a paradigm, uh, is quite frightening for the people who are invested in that paradigm. Part of the end of us versus them would be an end of uh, us in this room versus the scientists at Los Alamos, um, an end of us versus the, the people in government who are funding plutonium bomb factories, um, or of us versus the people who work in, uh, in that facility. Because, you know, the poetry kind of affected me. I'm just kind of like, <laughs> not really wanting to just, you know, make a speech. Um, I mean, really, on a, on, a, on a deep level, part of what's coming to an end is the paradigm of one guy up in front of 70 or 80 people. <laughs> In the position of the expert, you know. 
The paradigm that's ending has the seeds of healing in it. I was, in, in preparing for this event, I did a little research about nuclear waste. And it became clear to me that actually there are between 10 and 15 distinct technologies uh, that can be used to neutralize radioactive waste. Not just to bury it somewhere, but to actually uh, render it harmless. It might not be good to be too vocal about this because some people might say, well, we don't really have to worry about it. Um, just because we have these technologies doesn't mean we use them. In fact, we have many, many tech, pretty, pretty much any serious problem that you can think of. There's any serious environmental problem, there is a technology to, to, to solve it. There are technologies to reverse desertification, there are technologies to uh, remediate uh, petrochemical waste, there are technologies to, uh, to do pretty much anything, um, and there are technologies to neutralize radioactive waste also. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're going to, there are technologies to generate energy without making pollution, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're going to use them that way. Uh, the, and that's because every single one of these technologies is based on, um, is, is in conflict with mainstream paradigms. They are a little bit off the scientific radar screen. Some of them are a little bit off, some of them are way, way off. Um, but in order for us to adopt these technologies, uh, there has to be some kind of paradigmatic shift in our own in our own minds and in our own institutions. Otherwise, they'll be off limits. There's something that we cannot see from the reality picture that most of us, in fact, I would say all of us, to some extent, are still living in, myself included. Uh, the, the the paradigm, the story of of separation, the story of fighting things, the story of us versus them, the story of overcoming. Um, of changing the world through force. And that's really the essence of nuclear weapons. <clears throat> it goes back, um, it's, it's as deep as, as physics, as Newtonian physics, which still dominates our thinking. That in Newtonian physics, the, way, the only way to change the reality outside of you is to exert a force on it. Like, this thing's not going to move until I exert a force on it. Nothing's going to change unless you make it change. A human being isn't going to change unless you give them some kind of, and listen to how these political metaphors come in, unless you exert some pressure, right? unless you force them to change, unless you overcome your, the, your political enemies. So the assumption then is that human beings um, operate according to the same laws of physics as everything else. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, but what we mean when we talk about force in terms of politics or in terms of persuading somebody, changing their mind, it can be force of logic, it can be emotional force where you make someone feel guilty or ashamed uh, and, and change them that way, that's a kind of force. Or through some kind of rewards appealing to their vanity, appealing to their ego. Um, appealing to their financial self-interest, that's all a kind of force. And it says, really what it says is, you know, about, I don't know, the Los Alamos folks, the scientists, the, the politicians, the corporate people who are making all the money off it, it says, it says, I know you. You don't want to change. You like what you're doing. You are bad, as a matter of fact. You're, you're corrupt. You're... Uh, self-interested, -interest, you're greedy, so I'm going to make you change. I'm going to force you to change. Nuclear weapons are force taken to its, its furthest possible extreme. And when anything is taken to its furthest possible extreme, it gives birth to its opposite, which is what's happening today. Why do we think 
that we're going to change the world of force by exerting force ourselves. In order to accomplish nuclear healing, we have to be operating from a different paradigm. As Audre Lorde said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. If we use the methods of force and we come from the mentality of force, we are only going to add to the world of force. And so, I don't know, every time I hear people speaking about fighting the nuclear industry, um, fighting Los Alamos, fighting this, fighting that, I cringe a little bit. Because, and I'm not like a language police or anything, but, but it just kind of, it just kind of, um, it's kind of symptomatic uh, of a transition that within ourselves is not yet complete. And how could it be otherwise but incomplete when, after all, Los Alamos is not some outside thing, but it, it, it mirrors something within ourselves as well. It's a, 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 anything that, that we see in the outside world that triggers us, that we don't like, um, it's also revealing something about ourselves. So, I'd like to offer kind of this idea that That we, that, we, that we can consider uh, kind of a, a shift of our story, a shift of our operating paradigms, a shift of our operating belief systems uh, as a new ground for our strategies and our tactics in approaching the nuclear issue. Uh, because we haven't really been that successful. Really, to be honest, uh, how many years, I remember when I was in high school in the nuclear freeze, was the big, the big issue. I mean, it was pretty obvious in, what was that, like 1982 or 83, I remember? It was pretty obvious then that, you know, we had to stop nuclear weapons. That was like 30 years ago, you know? <coughs> we haven't stopped nuclear weapons. So, I'd like to, the, the conversation I want to invite, and I'm going to say a few more things before I get to it, before I, before I kind of open up that conversation, but I'd like to, to just invite the, 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 the idea that we have to come from a very different place um, in our perceptions and our strategies in order to accomplish this thing which our 30 years of experience has shown us to be impossible. I've been been uh, quoting, <laughs> one of my, it's my new favorite quote, uh, the 60s entertainer Sun Ra, you guys know, remember him? He was a very flamboyant fellow, uh, and, but he, he, he said, at one point he said, we've tried everything possible and none of it's worked, therefore we must try the impossible. <laughs> Almost anything else isn't even worth trying today. Uh, and, and this goes for, for uh, stopping the plutonium trigger factory. Uh, it goes for remediating nuclear waste. Um, all of these things are impossible, according to our old set of beliefs, according to Newtonian logic which despite quantum mechanics being 90 years old already, still dominates our perceptions of, of how the world works, uh, how things change. It, it dominates our uh, understanding of cause and effect, of exerting a force on something, which is really a very different understanding of the way the world works um, than most human beings ever had on, on, on this earth. Uh, Native peoples did not see the world as this playground of uh, force and mass. Um, but almost every culture besides ours understood that, that the tiniest actions have cosmic significance. Even if you have very little force at your disposal. Even if you are uh, a disabled woman walking with canes from Congo. 
she didn't have very much force at her disposal. Nima last night. Um, I think that a lot of the despair that, that arises among activists originates in um, the same worldview that is causing the problems that were active against in the first place. The worldview of, of separation, the worldview that says, you know, all you are is this, is this separate individual among other separate individuals in a universe that's also separate from us. From that operating pr perspective, your only power to change the world is the amount of force that you can muster, the amount of force that you can exert. And guess what? The powers that be have a lot more force than you do. And you're just one person, so nothing you do matters. Despair is the only conclusion of that. Uh, but that is also the mindset that generates nuclear weapons. It's the same mindset. We're being asked, everybody is being asked, to transition into a different mindset. The nuclear scientists, the policy makers, they're being asked to do that by the uh, impotence of their weapons, the uselessness of their weapons, to solve any of the problems that they're facing. None of, our, none of, the, of America's problems are being solved by nuclear weapons. And that's becoming harder and harder to deny. It's becoming undeniable as the budget crisis mounts, you know, as civil society breaks down, that we have these useless things here. It's also being put in our own faces as activists uh, by our 30 years of, of mostly failure, but, you know, occasional success um, in a tide that's moving the other direction. And so we're all uh, being invited into a transition in which we understand that our small actions are significant, whether we can see how they're significant or not. From that operating perspective, we also see, um, we see our, the people who would be our enemies in a different light. We see the, the nuclear scientist um, who's up there saying, you know, I'm a plutonium, plutonium chemist, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, and, and it's so triggering, you know, we feel so much anger come up and hatred, you know, like let's be honest, we feel hatred. But from another set of eyes, we see that guy and it's like, oh, he's scared. And he's clinging tightly to something that he doesn't even believe in anymore. And the last stage of, of letting go of something is to hold on as tight as possible to it. And, and then we think, how can we, what can we offer our brothers and sisters in the laboratories, in the nuclear laboratories? What's a positive vision? <clears throat> Why are they here? What are their gifts for? Well... I have a vision of, of Los Alamos, of the lab there, being um, a center for nuclear healing, um, where these technologies that I was just mentioning um, of uh, neutralizing radioactive waste, where these, where these are developed and applied, and, and people are trained in how to do them, and they're spread around the earth. Um, and you know, it's, it's a center for nuclear healing. And so then you, can, with this positive vision, then you can say, yeah, I mean, we're not going to shut it down and everyone who works there is going to lose their jobs. And you, Mr. Nuclear Scientist, you're useless. Uh, uh, and you, um, local person who's, you know, driving the truck there, like you're going to be out of a job. But actually there's going to be more jobs because, because we're not going to... Uh, attach ourselves to an obsolete technology, which is what nuclear weapons are. They're becoming obsolete. We're not, we're gonna, we're, we're not gonna cling to the past. We're gonna uh, go into the future. We're gonna uh, invest in the up-and-coming technologies, which are the technologies of nuclear healing. 
Um, and that, that's the future. You know, that's what's coming. Um, that's even from, well, anyway, I think that that's, that it's really important to be able to, to offer some kind of vision like that. And even if, like, I don't know, I'm, like, I don't really know the uh, issue as deeply as some of you do, um, but if we, we have to be able to, in every, in any different situation, um, when we see the, the, enemy or see the other as uh, a mirror of ourselves, as um, uh, brothers and sisters, then we become a lot more effective also. Uh, things that, strategies and even just ways of speaking that were, were once um, uh, not available to us become available. We know, and, and, and we become a lot less threatening too. It's, it's like almost a subtle energetic thing, you know, if somebody comes to you and said, and, and underneath their words is the sentiment like, I want what's best for you. You know, you're my brother. I want what's best for you. This is for, for your sake as well as mine. Even if you don't say it out loud, if that's the place you're coming from, you're not going to be threatening to them. You're not going to provoke um, as much hostility. And I, I don't know, like, to some of you who are, like, really hardcore activists who've, like, gone to jail, gone to prison, like, been beaten up by police, you know, and just, like, put your life on the line and see the, the horrible devastation that this industry's caused, like, I might be sounding a little bit naive. Uh, but I think that maybe we need a little bit of naivete um, to say, to say, you know, like, to say to the director of the uh, nuclear lab, to say, like, you know, I know that you really want to be in service to this earth, and I, I know that, that you don't really want to be doing this, you don't really want to, you're, you are not put here on earth to, to make bombs, you know? Like, and I know you want to change, I know you will. That is naive, in a way. But maybe we need some more naivete, because cynicism and, uh, Misanthropy hasn't really worked very well. <laughs> hasn't. Hasn't worked. So I guess what I'm just saying, uh, is to come ourselves from the non-nuclear place, uh, the place of uh, that recognizes the obsolescence of force. I just kind of got this this uh, picture of uh, nuclear waste with its really long half life. This poison that that just stays and stays and stays, and how it mirrors the way that we hold grudges and that we hold on to hatred um, and and resentment, you know, and and how in some paradigms, uh, in some some philosophies of health, that the cause of cancer is actually resentment that festers within. Um, the early doctors in the West, a few hundred years ago, they said cancer was caused by stagnant blood, bad blood. Bad blood's another name for, for enmity and resentment, right? There's bad blood between you. Um, and, of course, radioactive waste causes cancer. So I think that we're really, you know, nothing on, on Earth is happening uh, at random. Uh, what's happening on the outside is a symptom of what's happening on the inside. And I think that when we begin to operate from a place of, uh, when we begin to let go of the resentment uh, and enter forgiveness, uh, then the outward manifestation of that inward condition can begin to heal as well. So, I think that was mostly what was on my mind.
you can, this, you can see this isn't something I talk about as often, so I'm not quite as fluid um, with, with my words. But maybe, um, I, so I'd like to maybe Th Thomas was saying, you know, we could have um, kind of a, a group dialogue about it. I think that I'd like to make it kind of structured because um, there's a lot of voices and a lot that could be said and probably one or two people could could fill the room with words for the next 45 minutes and uh, uh, there's not really... <clears throat> it would be hard to get everybody to speak and I'm very wary of setting up a dictatorship of the loudest. <laughs> that happens sometimes, you know, when you just totally open it up. So I, I think um, I'd like to... Okay, yeah, so here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to invite you into like a little dialogue process. And so I've talked, okay. So on some level, we know that nuclear healing is possible, don't we? We know that it's possible. We, I speak of these um, uh, radioactive neutralization technologies that are out there just a little bit or a lot beyond the paradigms of, of the science of force. Uh, and maybe some of you are really skeptical, like, after all, if these existed, the scientists would have come up with them already, right? <laughs> they would be telling us about them, right? So our skepticism is also based in some of the same thought forms that the uh, authorities have been using to bamboozle us, right? Trust the authorities. Well, if we don't, if we no longer trust them when they say, oh, the facility is safe, the radioactive tests are safe, and so forth, if we no longer trust them when they say that, why should we trust them when they say, well, there are no, there is no technology that can neutralize radioactive waste, we just have to bury it somewhere. Why should we trust one half and not the other half? Uh, so, where was I going with that? Yeah. Um, so we have a. Um, I don't know if you felt or if you resonate with this is something that we can heal when we approach it from a different, uh, a different story um, of what's possible, a different story of how the world works, uh, which uh, includes different scientific paradigms. Uh, I don't know if you if you really resonate with that, but I believe that that on some level we all understand that that healing is always possible. It's just a matter of how much you want to let go of, and the healing of of radioactive waste, the healing of the planet is no different than the healing of human, of, of human beings. So we we know that it's possible, and many people um, I've been talking to a few people who all had the same vision, like at around the same time. Um, of, of what transformed Los Alamos could be. They all have the same vision, and it's a beautiful thing, a center of, of, he, of, of nuclear healing. And I think you can feel the truth of that vision, too. But, whenever we uh, catch a glimpse of this more beautiful world our heart is as possible, it also brings up pain, too. It brings up the pain that, that it's, that, and it brings up, brings up grief, it brings up anger, uh, that things aren't that way right now, that so much suffering has already happened. It brings up doubt, like what if, what if we don't make it? What if we're not good enough? Uh, what if, uh, I'm not good enough. What if I don't get to participate in it? What if it's too late? What if we've already missed our chance? What if human beings are just nature's big mistake? What if we're bad? What if we don't deserve it? What if we don't deserve this healing? It brings up all kinds of, of pain. And what if it just doesn't happen? You know? And um, I think that, that these doubts and, and hurts and wounds um, get in the way of are being effective activists. So, 
I'd like to, to, to so I'd like to invite a little dialogue between pairs of people. Um, and um, so you'll take turns. I'm just kind of improvising this right now. Uh, but you'll take turns, and each of you can, sh each of you will, will just share. Even just ignoring temporarily um, your conditioning about what's possible. Uh, but tap into that vision of what's possible. What could Los Alamos become? What would it look like from the ground? Because you're the ones who are living here. Uh, and what is the, and then, so, so like you just kind of maybe describe it back and forth to each other. It could be this, here's what could happen. And then, each take a turn and describe what hurts right now as you, as you uh, invoke uh, this little piece of a more beautiful world. What hurts right now? And as each person describes what hurts right now, the other person just gives that attention uh, without trying to problem solve, you know, without trying to comfort or console, but just to put that, that thing that hurts into a field of attention, of loving attention. Does that sound, um, how, how does that sound to you guys? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So let's, let's do that for a few minutes and then We'll um, do something else. <laughs> uh, two or three people, I think. I think pairs would be best with, with, with three.